it's good to be back at uh, West Coast Baptist Church, Junior Church Quarantine Edition. And uh, been good seeing some of you at church anyway. And I hope to see more of you real soon here. Um, President made a proclamation to try to get people going back to church. So we're excited about that. And uh, so hopefully we'll see uh, the rest of you soon. And, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get the buses rolling soon and stuff like that too. But, uh, but for now, we're going to have a great time at Junior Church. Um, we're missing a couple of our, of our uh, helpers, so we'll have some substitutes today. And but I think we'll do all right. I think we'll survive. All right. And so let's have a great time and learn something that God can help us with. And so let's go ahead and pray as we get started. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity uh, to study your word again and to um, uh, just give our thoughts uh, to spiritual things. And I just pray that you would use this time for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. All right, we're going to have AC lead us in a song to get us started. Hey guys, so we're going to sing a song, and this song is I've Got Jesus on My Mind. surrounded Wilfred as he stood on the deck of the Thomas Gray. Icy water splashed against the hull and sprayed upwards toward him. Wilfred Grenfell didn't mind, though. He liked the energy and invigoration that the cold brought him. He was also much too excited about being a missionary doctor to the fishermen on the North Sea to notice the cold. Here he was in the middle of the sea, ready to get to work. The morning sun glistened on the rough waters as the Thomas Gray neared the fishing boats. It didn't take long for word to spread that a doctor was on board. Anyone needing medical attention would have to wait, though, until the fishing nets were out of the water. The crew of the Thomas Gray quickly got to work putting the nets overboard. Wilfred helped where he could, hauling in the heavy nets and treating the frequent injuries. Once the fishing was over, men and boys from the other boats came aboard for treatment. I, I cut my hand real bad a few months back, a boy of about 14 said. It never really got better, and it, it hurts real bad. Well, lad, let me have a look at it, Wilfred said, removing the glove from the boy's hand. The cut was nasty looking and the hand greatly infected. It looked as if it had not been bandaged and kept clean. If Wilfred did not treat it quickly, the boy might lose his hand. The boy sat still and let Wilfred work on the infection. The two talked and Wilfred was able to share the gospel with him. Once the hand was bandaged, the lad went back to work and another patient was waiting for Wilfred. He worked tirelessly for hours and fell into bed exhausted from a long but exciting day. Wilfred loved his time on the North Sea. Every morning we'd take off his clothes and take a snow bath right on the deck of the boat. It helped keep his body invigorated and well circulated. He spent long hours fishing alongside the men and many more hours treating their injuries and sickness. He held Bible studies and talked to the fishermen about what Jesus did for them on the cross. If you would go overboard and drown in the sea, where would you spend eternity? Wilfred asked an old man. Uh, well, well, I'm guessing I'd go to heaven, the old fisherman stammered. 
I've lived a fairly good life providing for my family, and I've been to church a few times. Ah, uh, so being good is what you're relying on, Wilfred went on. The Bible says that all our righteousness and good living is as filthy rags. It's not worth anything. None of us are good enough to get to heaven. The old fisherman looks concerned. How are we supposed to get to heaven then? He asked. I'm glad you asked, Wilfred asked with a smile. God sent Jesus Christ to earth to die for all of us. He's the only one who's actually good. He died to take all your sin away. We only need to ask him to save us, and he will. Can, can I ask him to save me? The man asked with sincere eyes. Yes, you may. He's just waiting on you, Wilfred said. The man awkwardly bowed his head and asked Jesus to come into his heart and save him. When he opened his eyes, tears were filling them. Wilfred thanked God for the opportunity to share the gospel with these fishermen. So that's um, what we have today for Wilfred. And now let's go into our verse, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Please repeat after me. And um, those of you at home, if you want to say it to your parents and stuff, that would um, help and have help them help you, that would be beneficial. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be steadfast, unmovable, unmovable, always abounding in the work, always abounding in the work of the Lord, of the Lord, for as much as ye know, for as much as ye know, that your labor is not in vain, that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord, in, in the, the Lord. Lord. Hey kids, I'd like to teach you a song that uh, I don't think um, has been sung around here, but it's a really good song and it'll go, go together with our lesson today. Uh, so it's called, It's Amazing What Praising Can Do. And uh, so Miss Yesenia will probably put the words there so you can follow along. And uh, But I'm going to have the kids help me sing it that are here. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to pick it up and we can do it in junior church when we get back together again. All right, so it's called, It's Amazing What Praising Can Do. that and learn that. It's a great song to remember throughout the day because it is amazing what praising can do. talked about how he uh, uh, played his harp while watching the uh, the sheep and uh, let's uh, let's look in the Bible today first uh, Samuel chapter 16 all right first Samuel chapter 16 so this is uh, before he fought with uh, Goliath first uh, Samuel 16 and I'm going to start reading at verse number 14 now you probably remember King Saul uh, was the first king of Israel and uh, he started out looking like he was going to be a good king, but then he kept making bad choices. He, 
He wouldn't uh, obey God. He wouldn't um, you know, do what God wanted him to do. And so God was going to take the kingdom away from him and make David the next king. Well, in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14, it says, the, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Um, <clears throat> in those days, it was before Jesus came and before the Holy Spirit was given to us as believers. And so the Holy Spirit didn't live in him, uh, in King Saul, like he lives in us. You know, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you and he's never going to leave. Uh, but the Holy Spirit <clears throat> departed from King Saul. And instead of the Holy Spirit, God sent an evil spirit, allowed an evil spirit to come to trouble Saul as punishment uh, for his disobedience. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. So Saul had some servants uh, that were pretty uh, uh, wise, and they understood the power of music. And so he said, King, uh, when that evil spirit comes upon you, let's find a talented musician, somebody that can play the harp, because uh, the harp, uh, probably not like the harp that we think of today, probably, uh, I've been told that it was probably a, a, an instrument that had like 10 strings and, and uh, probably didn't uh, uh, have a full uh, octave of notes like we think of today, but it had just uh, five notes. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, but it would have been a beautiful, soft sound, kind of like our, our harps today. And, uh, and so David, uh, <clears throat> of course, played a harp. And the servant said, hey, we should find somebody who plays a harp and plays it well to help the king get calmed down and uh, to help him feel better when that evil spirit troubles him. And so Saul said in verse 17, uh, unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing. That means he plays with great skill. And he's also a mighty, valiant man. All right, he's a strong man. Perhaps this servant had heard about how David had killed the lion and the bear. And, he's a, and, and he said that he's a man of war and prudent in matters. So, uh, he knew that David was a, was a wise young man and a comely person, all right? In other words, he's good looking because uh, kings are kind of that way. They don't want ugly people around, you know? So, uh, so that probably was significant to him. And, and he said, the Lord is with him. And so <clears throat> think about David. What a testimony he had that people that probably David didn't know this servant, but this servant knew about David knew that he had worked hard at playing the harp, knew that he was a godly young man, that he was a faithful young man, dependable, and all those things we've talked about already. David already had a great reputation. So in verse number 19, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with the bread and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And of course, a kid there is not a child, okay? That's, that's a, a lamb, okay? And uh, uh, as, a, as a gift for the king. And so, and so David comes to the king with these gifts from his father. And, uh, and the Bible says, verse 21, David uh, came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And so David loved Saul, and Saul appreciated David, and David became Saul's armor bearer, which is a very trusted position, a very trusted servant, uh, be very close to the king all the time. And uh, Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And so the king tells uh, Jesse, Hey, uh, David's working for me now. Sorry, you're going to have to find somebody else to watch the sheep. And... Uh, but then I want you to notice verse number 23. It came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand, and Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Let's pray, and we want to talk a little bit about the power of music today. 
Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that you would speak to us through it now and help us to understand, uh, Lord, how important it is to make right choices, excuse me, about music, and Lord, how important it is for us to praise you uh, with our songs. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, now, <clears throat> here in this verse, we find some important things about music. Um, <clears throat> we see that music can affect us very powerfully. And this music that David played with his heart did three things to Saul, okay? It says that first of all, Saul was refreshed. He was refreshed. Um, <clears throat> I'm told that the idea there is that it, it affected him physically, and made him physically feel better. Whereas King Saul might have been tired, might have had a tummy ache, might have had a headache, but this, this music made him physically feel better. Then it says that he was well. Uh, the idea there is, is that he uh, um, <clears throat> was, uh, that, that his spirit was refreshed. Uh, that he emotionally felt bad. Instead of being sad, now he feels uh, comforted a little better, uh, or perhaps even happy by the end. It made him feel better emotionally. And then he says that the evil spirit departed from him. Obviously, that meant that it helped him spiritually because that evil spirit was gone. Now, so what does this teach us about music in our lives? Well, music has that same power to affect us. Um, <clears throat> that's why some music uh, can draw us closer to God and worshiping and praising Him and loving Him better and can challenge us to be better Christians, whereas some music will actually encourage us uh, to be worldly and to desire sinful things. Um, <clears throat> and so we need to be careful about the kind of music that we have in our lives uh, because it does affect us. Now, Music, uh, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to go ahead and flip over there real quick. We have an, another important verse about music. Music is so important. The Bible talks about music hundreds and hundreds of times, especially when we count all the different times that we're told to praise God and all the examples of songs in the Bible, especially the book of Psalms is all songs. And so God has a lot to say about music. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us uh, that God created music. Not only did God create music, uh, but music is intended to glorify Him. It's intended to be used to worship and praise Him. And God even created an angel with special musical abilities so that he could uh, essentially lead the praise choir in heaven. Isaiah chapter 14 tells us who that angel was. It's the angel that we know today as the devil and Lucifer. And that's why we need to be very careful about our music because the angel that knows the most about music is now our enemy. He's rebelled against God. <clears throat> and now he's going to use music to try to get people to turn away from God. And we see that very powerfully being done today with all the powerful and evil music that's in the world. But listen to Colossians 3.16. He says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So he says that our music should help us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. All right, so what's that tell us about our music? It tells us that our, our music should be singing the truth that we find in the Bible. Now, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, we open up a book that we call the hymnal, and we sing songs out of the hymnal. And every song in that book has truth in it based on the Bible. And singing those songs will help us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Now, those aren't the only good songs in the world. But there's certainly a great, great set of them. We have over 800 of them in that book. But we need to understand that the words of our music are very important. 
Sometimes people think, well, I don't know, I, I'm not worried about what the words are, I just like the tune, or, or I like the, the, the beat, or I like the way it makes me feel, or whatever. Uh, but we need to understand the words are very important. The words need to glorify God. Um, <clears throat> he also, in this verse, tells us three kinds of music we should use. We should use psalms, all right? That's, that's uh, the book of psalms. That's uh, mostly uh, praise to God. Um, and boys, you read the psalms, there's a, a common theme that comes up all the time uh, of God, uh, of David calling on God and saying, God, I need your help. I'm facing all these problems. And then God helps him. And then he praises God for that help. And so they're, they're wonderful songs in the book of Psalms. Uh, but he says we need psalms and we need hymns. All right. We find hymns in our hymnal, obviously. But a hymn is a song that praises God. So a hymn is a song that talks about who God is. You know, songs like holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. All right. What are we doing? We're praising God for who he is. Um, and then spiritual songs. Those are songs that talk about uh, our spiritual experience. Um, you know, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Um, you know, it's talking about the experience of being a Christian. That's a spiritual song. And so these are the kind of songs we should be singing, not songs uh, about me, right? Not songs about sin, not songs about selfish things of the world. Uh, <clears throat> let the world have their songs. We don't want to have anything to do with those. Those are not going to help us be better Christians. Those are going to lead us away from God. And so we need to have songs with the right kind of words. But also, um, <clears throat> in Ephesians, we have a similar verse. In Ephesians 5, and verse 18, um, we're told to be filled with the Spirit. And then in verse 19, he says that when we are, uh, we'll be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's those three kinds of music for the Christian again. Then he says, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> music has three parts, all right? Three different aspects to music. There's the melody, all right? That's the tune. Uh, like when we, like if I start humming, all right, you know what song I'm, I'm humming, right? Jesus loves me because that's the melody of that song. That's the tune of that song. And so we identify that and that tune carries a message, okay? And so that's the most important part of music. That's why so much of the world's music today uh, doesn't even have a melody, you know, especially, uh, uh, you know, certain uh, uh, kinds of, of rap music and stuff. It's all about the rhythm and th there's no melody at all. Uh, they're turning music upside down. All right, they're, they're taking away the most important part of what makes music. All right, so, so melody is very important. And, uh, and, and, and you know, sometimes um, when you uh, have some quiet time, maybe you spend some time in prayer, uh, a tune will come to your mind, right? Some, some song that you've sung in church will pop into your mind. And that's, that's the Holy Spirit helping you worship God. And so the melody is very important. And the melody corresponds to the spiritual part of man. That's why uh, here in Ephesians 5, when he says we're filled with the Spirit, we'll be speaking to ourselves uh, and making melody in our hearts. Um, and so the melody is the most important part of the, of the song uh, from a spiritual perspective. Then the second aspect of music uh, is the idea of harmony. All right. Uh, if you open up a hymnal and uh, you try to follow along as we sing a song, you'll note that the, the, the melody of the song is the top note, all right? The black dot with lines on it. All right, it goes up and down as we sing higher notes and lower notes. Um, that's the melody. But then there's other notes underneath of it. And what those notes are for is for harmony. Because when you play two notes at the same time, they're either going to sound bad together or they're going to sound really beautiful together. And when they sound really beautiful together, we call that harmony. And so good music will have harmony. I remember years ago listening to a, song, uh, a, a cassette tape that was supposed to be Christian music. And, uh, and they didn't have uh, any, you know, uh, crazy instruments or drums or anything going on. It was just people's voices. But the harmony that they used... Uh, was not a harmony that gave you peace. 
It wasn't a harmony that lifted you up. Some of the harmony they used was, was really kind of, you know, irritate you and make you, make you on edge. And, uh, and they did that on purpose, um, but I, I don't believe that that was what God would have us do uh, consistently with our music. That, that harmony, uh, because that harmony affects us emotionally, all right? We saw how David's music playing on the harp, uh, it, it affected Saul uh, spiritually, the evil spirit left, but it also affected him emotionally. He felt better emotionally. And, and it's the harmony that helps us do that. And when we're worshiping God in church, um, you know, maybe we've got the organ going or the piano going, or we've got uh, people singing harmony parts, and, and there's, it makes it more emotional uh, as we're singing God's praise. It helps to bring out the message of the melody when there's good harmony. All right? Now, the third part of music is the rhythm. Now, rhythm, sometimes we use that word, sometimes you people use that and say, oh, you know, rhythm, and they talk about it like it's a bad thing. Well, <clears throat> rhythm is necessary for music. Um, it's kind of like the heartbeat, all right? You know, you've, you've got a pulse. Uh, music has to have a pulse. Uh, rhythm tells us how long to make each sound, all right? So if you don't have consistent rhythm, then you can't really tell what the, what the melody is either. So you have to have rhythm for music to work. Um, but what people do today is two things. First of all, they make the rhythm more important than the melody, more important than the tune, more important than the message. They make the beat, that rhythm, they make that the message because they want you to, to, to dance and they want you uh, to give in to what your body feels like doing, all right? Because the rhythm corresponds to our flesh. That's why... Um, when, uh, when, when we're singing in church sometimes, you might start tapping your toe to keep time, you know, and you might notice uh, that the song leader is flapping his arm, all right, and, and sometimes he'll be even swaying or, or tapping his toe or whatever to keep the time correctly uh, as we sing the song, uh, because it's a very important part of, of music uh, to make it work, all right, but again, what the, what the devil has done with a lot of the world's music is it's taken what would be the normal rhythm of a song that helps it to flow along and be beautiful and worship to God, and it changes the rhythm, all right? And I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but if you, if you, uh, you know, pound on a drum or, or even on a piano or a guitar or something like that, and you make it emphasize an unnatural beat, that's not just helping the melody carry on, but it's doing something different than the melody, um, <clears throat> or changes the melody, <clears throat> that's what makes people dance, okay? Because it affects us physically. And, uh, <clears throat> and so much of what the world calls dancing really is uh, inappropriate, all right? It's, it's moving your body in a way that's... that's uh, that is uh, suggestive of evil things. And I don't want to say any more about that because I know I'm talking to kids. But, <clears throat> but we need to understand that, that God's type of music, the kind of music that pleases God, is going to have good words. The melody is going to be the most important thing. The tune is going to be the most important thing. It's going to be strengthened by <clears throat> harmony that helps lift us up and carry the message of the melody. And the rhythm is, is just... Uh, making sure that melody keeps going properly and <clears throat> not something that's going to make us, you know, shake our rear ends or something like that, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I just want to challenge you to think about the music that you like. Um, somebody said, well, I just, I know what I like when it comes to music. Um, well, the truth of the matter is you, you like what you know, okay? Um, I grew up with parents who listened to country music. And so for a long time, I liked country music, but some of my friends thought country music was the most sad and weird and boring and annoying sounding music on earth. Why? Because they didn't grow up listening to that. Now, once I became a Christian and really gave myself to following Christ, I gave up the country music and gave up the kind of music my friends were listening to and, and got some good Christian music, and that's what you ought to do. But... Uh, <clears throat> But what I want you to see is, even though you might 
love the world's music right now. You can learn to love God's music if you'll make it a part of your life. And you'll find that it'll strengthen you and help you to be faithful to God and help you to love God better if you have the right kind of music. And so let's go ahead and uh, pray. And uh, I hope that you'll take these thoughts to heart. Maybe if you've got some music that you've been listening to on your phone or iPod or whatever you got that you know doesn't please God, maybe it's time to get rid of it. Uh, but let's, let's honor the Lord with our music. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study this important topic. I thank you for David. Uh, what, a, what a faithful and talented and hardworking young man to develop his talents and use them for you. And I pray that you'd work in uh, the young people of our church, that they would uh, be challenged to do that as well, to learn some musical instruments that they can use to uh, serve you better. But Lord, also, and perhaps more importantly, I pray that you'd help us to make right choices about music, that we would not uh, uh, make music a part of our lives that's going to drag us down into sin and into the world's way of thinking, but rather we would get music into our lives that would help us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor Philotel. And now I have a question for you guys. What does a CD, a DVD, and a store all have in common? They all use music to influence us. Music influences our emotions, as Pastor Philotel taught us. It can make us happy, sad, tense, relaxed. It, if you turned off the sound of a show with at a scary part. Would it still be as scary? Maybe, but not as much. Stores play happy music so that people want to buy more stuff from them and they'll make more money. Whether we realize it or not, music changes our feelings. That is why we must be so careful about the hitting music in our lives. All right, here we are, <clears throat> ready for our review questions from last week's lesson. And we're going to see who's the smartest of the four dilemmas out there. All right, so question number one. Who was the Philistine that had the Israelites so scared? Samson. Evelyn. No. Elijah? Uh, Goliath? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> All right, question number two. Who finally went to fight Goliath? All right. Was AC first? Judges? Oh, yeah. AC. All right, AC. Um, what was the question again, sir? Who finally went to fight Goliath? David. All right, very good. Next question. How many stones did David pick up from the brook? Nehemiah. Twelve. Wrong. Elijah. Five. That's correct. <clears throat> All right, question number four. So right now the score is we've got two for Elijah, one for AC. And these other guys are here too. <laughs> All right, question number four. How many stones did it take David to knock down Goliath? I think AC broke in. Room. Abby. One. <clears throat> That's correct. Okay, so, last question. <clears throat> what did David trust in to win the battle? AC. God. That's correct. Which gives us a tie between Elijah and AC. Mm. What shall we do? All right, Elijah and AC, we'll have to give you a runoff question here from the lesson before. All right. Who did God use to anoint the next king of Israel? Elijah. Samuel. That's correct. Ah! Elijah is the smartest of the ah! All right, kids. Time for our review questions from today's lesson. So 
Make sure you uh, answer these down below in the comment section if you can, uh, or put them down on paper and bring them to us next time you come to church. All right, here's the first question. Why was King Saul so grumpy? Okay, why was he so unhappy? Question number two. Who came to the palace to help him? All right, who was it that they brought to the palace to help the king, help King Saul? Uh, number three, what did David use to calm King Saul? All right, what did he use to calm the king down? Number four, who created music? All right, who created music? And lastly, who corrupts music and makes it ungodly? All right, who takes music and makes it bad? All right, who, who's behind that? All right, so hopefully you can get those. Some of those might be a little bit difficult because we went over some of those things quickly. But if you were listening good, you should be able to get them. And uh, we hope, uh, hope that you will answer below or, or bring those questions to us when we see you again. All right, so <clears throat> looking forward to getting back to real junior church real soon. Uh, hope to see you then, if not sooner. And uh, let's have a great week praising Jesus not listening to the filthy music of the world. All right, so long, see you soon.